Well, I wonder if you've uh, given much thought to what it would be like to be blind. I don't know if anybody here has uh, family members, relatives, friends who are blind, uh, perhaps partially, perhaps uh, they have been losing their sight over time, uh, more perhaps vision impaired. Uh, I know many of us do need glasses, especially as we age, so some of us have uh, some experience of that. But of course, blindness is uh, complete or almost complete loss of sight in your eyes. Uh, vision impairment is something similar, partial blindness perhaps, a restriction in our ability to see. Some of us experience something of that. But Blindness is a particularly challenging condition, isn't it? As if, we, if we've been used to being able to see for all of our lives, to lose our sight would be very difficult. We'd have to learn so many things, uh, so many of the things that we rely on every day, perhaps just for entertainment, perhaps for uh, education and understanding. So many of those things would be much more difficult, let alone just moving around. Now, there are... Uh, things that have been done to make it possible for people who are blind to, to have uh, good lives and, and be able to get around, for example. Uh, things, some, some things that are relatively recent inventions. Uh, guide dogs. Um, even more technological advances. There are glasses now that can give uh, auditory signals when something is coming close and so on, so a person can, can have some support in getting around, but it's a, it's a difficult condition. And a pic particularly if somebody has been blind since birth. Um, it, it's called congenital blindness and there's still only a small amount of understanding of how it happens. They're doing research into it and, and why it happens. And that particularly is, is difficult. Uh, some years ago, uh, we got to know the little daughter of one of my classmates who had been born with uh, a serious vision impairment. She was legally blind, she would never be able to drive, but she was able to do uh, remarkable things. She could see a little bit, I guess, of, of light and so on. I think it was maybe 10 or 15%, but she ran around and seemed to play and enjoy herself with the other kids, uh, was able to, to go to school with, with assistance, obviously. But it's still a very difficult condition, isn't it? Uh, and blindness. And there is still no cure for blindness, even though there are some aspects uh, of blindness that can be cured. You remember Fred Hollows uh, pioneered that uh, treatment of uh, glaucoma, I believe, and being able to give, give sight back to people who had been gradually losing it over time. But there is no cure to, uh, to congenital blindness. Blindness can also be used as a metaphor, can't it? To describe our lack of understanding or perhaps our complete ignorance of some matter. People can be blind to all sorts of things. Blind to racism. Blind to their own faults and failings. Uh, we can be blind to injustice. We can be blind to inequality. And of course, in the Bible, there is a suggestion that we can, of course, be blind towards the things of God. Not understand the truths that God wants us to know. Today we're looking at a story of Jesus' encounter with a blind man uh, just outside of Jericho as he's making his way towards Jerusalem. And it's an interesting story about uh, this particular encounter, but there is more to what's going on here. There's some sig more significance to this story, I think, and uh, we're going to explore that as we go along. But let's start off by looking at uh, Jesus' encounter with this blind man that begins in Luke chapter 18 at verse 35. And we're told that as Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. The man is obviously in great need, not being able to, to work and earn any income, so he has to beg. The first thing, though, I want to uh, really look at here is in the first few verses. It's about the location of where Jesus meets this man. He's on the road to Jericho, or coming close to Jericho, perhaps just right on the outskirts of Jericho. Now, Jericho is a, a 
town, a small city, I guess, these days, which is about a day's walk from Jerusalem. So as we know, Jesus has been on the road towards Jerusalem, coming from Galilee up in the north, uh, well, in Luke's account, since chapter 9, where he set his face resolutely to head towards Jerusalem. And Jesus set his face to do that because he knew this would be his last trip. When he gets to Jerusalem, well, Jesus knows what is going to happen there. Um, If we go back to chapter 9, Jesus was already saying that when when he gets there, the Son of Man has to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. He must be killed and on the third day raised to life. And then, as we saw last week, Jesus was still predicting his death when he got to Jerusalem. And so now he, here he is, basically a day's walk from the city where he will meet his end, where all those uh, dramatic events will take place. Jesus is coming to the end of this journey and the end of his mission. He's, he's been on a mission and along the way he's been teaching the people about what it means to truly be a disciple, a follower of Jesus. He's been teaching the people about the kingdom of God, what it is and how they can enter. He has been challenging them, challenging them in all sorts of ways, uh, not least to follow him wholeheartedly. Remember the, the rich man who had been, who came to Jesus and, and was asking him how he could enter the kingdom of God? Jesus looked at him and loved him and but gave him the challenge. Well, sell everything you have, give to the poor and come follow me. Then you'll have riches in the kingdom of God. And the man went away sad because he had great wealth. Many challenges that Jesus gives about what it means to follow him in this section, but the journey is coming to its end. And so, as Jesus approaches Jericho, he meets the blind man. No doubt many people by this stage would know who Jesus was and know what he'd been doing. He'd been healing so many people of all sorts of uh, sicknesses. This isn't the first blind man that Jesus has been able to help. Jesus has been casting out demons, showing his authority over, over the evil spirits. And he's been teaching about the kingdom of God. So, so many people would have known who he was and no doubt this man has heard about it as well. Perhaps he was hoping that Jesus would pass by. And when he hears that that's who is coming, well... The people told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And so he calls out, verse 38, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He cries out in a way that shows that he knows who who Jesus is. He calls him son of David, which is another way of saying you are the king, you are the Messiah, perhaps the great promised king, the one that we've all been looking forward to. No doubt he's thinking of all the things that Jesus has already done. And so he calls out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He gets an interesting response. They tell him to be quiet. Perhaps they're thinking, oh, don't disturb Jesus, he's got better things to do. Although, if it was the disciples who had been with Jesus the whole time, the apostles, they should have known by now that that wasn't a good response to have. Do you remember... What happened when they they said to the the parents, no, don't disturb Jesus with your children. They they were coming to have their children blessed. Don't disturb the the teacher. Jesus said to them, no, let the little children come to me. The kingdom of God belongs to, to such as these. He rebuked the disciples. Well, I, I think they would have, well, they weren't always quick to learn their lesson, were they? But you'd think they would have learnt their lesson now. I actually actually wonder if it was more the local people who were trying to get this blind man to to be quiet. Perhaps they didn't want Jesus knowing that there were people uh, begging on the streets in their town. But I actually wonder if it was more than that. The blind man calls out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. It's basically a declaration that he knows that Jesus is the Messiah that he has come from God. 
that he is the one that they should be looking to and listening to and following. And in Jericho, because it was a, a town fairly close to Jerusalem, there were actually a lot of religious people, religious leaders that is, the priests in particular, who because it was a day's walk, they could, they could easily go and do their, their um, turn working at the temple. And so there would have been priests in the, in the crowd and their families, there would have been uh, religious leaders amongst the Pharisees. Apart from Jerusalem, it was perhaps one of the most important uh, towns for the religious leaders in Israel at the time. And so when the blind man is crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, the locals might not have been very happy because there were many of the religious leaders who didn't want anybody to recognise Jesus as the, as the Messiah. They had already been listening to him and as we've seen, they have formed a, an animosity towards Jesus. They're rejecting him already. And so they wouldn't be happy for somebody to cry out about Jesus being the Messiah. But here's the strange thing, isn't it? By this stage, you would think that anybody would understand that Jesus is the one promised, that he really was the son of David. And so the blind man, when he's told to be quiet, you know what he does? He's not quiet. <laughs> he says, he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. He's declaring that Jesus is the Messiah and he wants to be blessed, he wants to be helped. He might not be able to see, but he could see enough to know that Jesus was his best hope. Even a blind man could see that Jesus, the son of David, is the best hope for all of Israel, let alone for a blind man begging by the side of the road. And so Jesus stops and, and speaks with him. In fact, he asked the man to be brought to him. When he came near, verse 41, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Seems a bit strange. You would think that Jesus would be able to, to see uh, that the man was blind and that that would be why he, helped, he wants help. But I think actually Jesus wants the man to express his, his need. He's already called out in a way that shows he, he believes Jesus is someone special. But when Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? He says, Lord, I want to see. a great statement I want to see when you're blind what else can you want it's the thing that's going to make the biggest difference and I think that what Jesus hears in the man and what he's already heard from the man is a faith a real trust that Jesus is the one who can help him if he believes that Jesus is the Messiah then well who else can help him and so Jesus heals him. He says, verse 42, receive your sight, your faith has healed you. Notice the importance of faith in all this. Through faith in Jesus, the man is able to see. Notice then the end result in verse 43. Immediately he received his sight, followed Jesus, praising God. When the man is healed... When he receives that blessing from Jesus, he praises God. He doesn't praise Jesus directly, I guess. He praises God for what Jesus has done. That's, that's what Jesus has come to do, to draw people to praise God. And not only that, when the people saw it, they also praised God. Again, what Jesus is on about is doing these things so that the people will see what's going on, that the kingdom of God is coming so that many people will praise God. And so Jesus heals the blind man and it results in glory to God. Which is a great story for Luke to put in his gospel, but you've got to ask the question, when Jesus has already healed a number of people, been recorded of healing a number of blind people and done lots of miracles, so many that you know, there's no way he's going to put all of them in his account, why does he put this healing here? at this point in the journey, at this almost at the end of the mission. Well, I think it's got to do with 
reminding us of what Jesus' mission is all about. Do you remember that in the early days of his ministry, Jesus uh, had a particular moment in the synagogue in Nazareth where he declared, in a sense, what his mission was. Uh, it was that passage that was read for us from Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, uh, particularly starting there at verse 18. Well, verse 16, he's in Nazareth. He goes into the synagogue, stands up to read, and they're given, he's given the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he finds the place and reads this uh, from verse 18. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. He rolls up the scroll, gives it back, says to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The prophecy is recognised as something which is being spoken to God's anointed servant or anointed king the spirit of the lord is on me to do this he's going to set people free he's going to proclaim the good news the good news of salvation and the restoration of god's kingdom he's going to give the blind their sight and so i think when luke puts this uh, healing right here at the end of this section he's saying You remember what Jesus said he was going to do? Remember that Jesus' mission is to proclaim the good news, to set people free, to make the blind see? He's done it. He's fulfilled it. The king has come, the spirit-anointed king has come, he has proclaimed the kingdom and now he's bringing it in. In fact, he's bringing it into Jerusalem where the kings go to be crowned and Jesus is going to be crowned very soon, just not in a standard sort of coronation. Is he? You know that he'll be crowned with a crown of thorns and his throne will be a cross. Now the king is coming and Luke is saying he's fulfilling the mission. And when Jesus says that he is coming to proclaim the good news, set people free, make the blind see. Although he is speaking literally, in a sense, because the blind do see, and those who are bound spiritually with demonic forces and so on, they're set free. And He's also speaking symbolically, metaphorically, spiritually as well, isn't he? Because it's not just about those who are literally in prison being set free. It's not just about those who are literally blind being able to see. It's about those who are in spiritual bondage being set free. It's about those who are spiritually blind and unable to see the truth about God, unable to see the truth about Jesus. It's about those being able to see. And there were so many people, even in Jesus' day, who couldn't see. They had spiritual blinkers on. They were blind spiritually. They couldn't see that Jesus had come from the Father. They couldn't see that he had come to bring in the kingdom of God. They couldn't see that he had come to bring forgiveness and and restoration of relationship with the Father in a way that nobody could have ever had before. There were so many people who were blind thinking that he's just a, another revolutionary or perhaps even that he was evil, that he was possessed by evil spirits. Or perhaps they were just threatened by the power that he might have if, and, and the power they would lose if he really was the king. And so, so many of the religious leaders opposed him. And we'll see how that works out as we, as we come into the, the final chapters of Luke's Gospel as Jesus is arrested as he is tortured, as he is killed. There were many who were opposed to him. But what we need to understand is that they were blind, spiritually. They couldn't see. And yet Jesus had come 
to help the blind see, to give spiritual healing, even more perhaps than physical healing. Now there are, there are other places where this spiritual blindness is spoken about uh, in the scriptures. The Apostle Paul uh, describes it like this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4 where he says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. The God of this age, the devil, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ. The good news shows us the glory of Christ. And there are so many people who just can't see that. And it's not a, an intellectual problem, really. It's a spiritual problem. And the only way that they can see the truth is by the work of God's Spirit within them. They're bound by, by the devil. And only the Holy Spirit can break those chains. Only the Holy Spirit can give spiritual sight like that. How does he do it? Well, he does it when the good news is proclaimed, when people talk about Jesus and when, when people explain the salvation that we can have through Jesus. That's how people are able to spiritually see the truth. So this passage reminds us not only that Jesus was on a mission, that he was doing his part and he was about to complete his mission when he came into Jerusalem but it also reminds us doesn't it that well that everybody needs spiritual healing that everybody needs to have their eyes opened by God even children who are born into believing families need to hear about the goodness of Jesus because we're all born I think uh, in a sense spiritually blind we need to have our eyes opened. You know that little children, when they're first born, even if they, they have good eyesight, they really can't see much at first. You can kind of tell that all they can see is sort of light and dark and perhaps some colour or something like that because they don't focus on anything. I've had experience in recent times of some little babies and you, you, you know that they, they look sort of... They don't, well, they don't look at you, do they? They just their eyes are moving around and then after a little while they do start to focus you can see that they're, they're trying to look at you and then a little bit later they you can tell that they're focusing because they're responding to you they're following you and then they start smiling and then you feel fantastic because they're smiling at you and it's lovely how hard is it for a, a, a parent or somebody to notice that their child is not able to see, that they are blind physically. Well, I think when we're all we're, we're born, we all have this sort of inability to see properly. The scriptures are telling us that unbelievers are blinded, and the only way they can learn the truth is for God to open their eyes. And the way that he does that is as they hear about Jesus. And so that's a reminder to us that we all have a part to play in teaching our children, our grandchildren, about the Lord. We all have a part to play in sharing that good news with those around us, our neighbours, our families, our friends. Because it's only as people hear about Jesus that spiritually they can, they can see it's a fantastic thing to have our eyes opened. It's a fantastic thing to be set free from spiritual bondage. But that's why Jesus came, isn't it? He came on that mission to proclaim the good news, to set the prisoners free, to restore the sight of the blind. Praise God that Jesus has made that possible for us. And friends, let me encourage all of us to respond to him in faith, 
the faith which opens our eyes. Trust Jesus for salvation and for life. Let's pray that we'll be able to do that, shall we? Father God, we thank you for the great gift of your son Jesus, that he came into our world proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and of salvation through faith in him. Father, we pray for each one of us here that you might indeed uh, open our eyes if they haven't already been opened, that you'll continue to open them, that we might put our faith in Jesus. Father, help us to be thoughtful and careful to share that good news with those around us that we might see more eyes opened. Father, we pray for family members, for, for friends, for loved ones that you might open their eyes. And Father, we do thank you that in your mercy you are gracious and that you do this for many people. We pray that you might continue to be at work among us and in the lives of those around us, that many, many more people will see the glory that is in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.